Daniel Morris of BNB Paribas Asset Management joins us right now from London. Daniel, good having you. Thanks much for joining in. Good morning to you out there. Uh, sure. Would you reckon that um, assets and equity assets in particular could remain under pressure after not just Donald Trump's tweet, but Lighthizer's comments as well about the rates, the tariffs going up on Friday. Will that have a prolonged impact on, on risk assets? Uh, well, I think it will certainly depend on how quickly this is resolved. But the reaction of the markets over the last couple of days certainly highlights the vulnerability in equity markets uh, to disappointment. I mean, essentially, we've already priced in the agreement between the U.S. and China, so anything that upsets that assumption clearly reflected quite quickly in the markets. Uh, a lot of uncertainty uh, as much as anything else around the actual details of the agreement, if and when it comes. So, yes, I think we're likely to see continued volatility until this is all done and dusted. And at this point, we're not certain exactly when that's going to be. Uh, Daniel, the, the nature of the rally, at least in the U.S. markets, was that it was a very narrow move. At least uh, most people seem to suggest that for the better part of 2018. What we've started to see now when the corrections are happening, that they're more broader in nature, especially the one yesterday, which was very similar to what happened on Christmas Eve, wherein almost 90 percent of the S&P 500 constituents came off. Would you reckon that this nervousness, I mean, I, I take on board your point that th this depends on when it gets resolved until we get any kind of news flow about the resolution, would you believe that equities across in this impacted countries would see a bit of a pullback? And how severe could the pullback be? Would it be swift in nature or would it be a, a slow, gradual one? Well, you've got to think about what are the risks to the market at this point besides a breakdown in the negotiations between the U.S. and China. Uh, of course, Trump could turn just as quickly to threats of tariffs against Europe, and I think it's clear what that would do, particularly to European equities and German equities. Uh, I think on the other hand, though, we need to recognize what's supporting the market, which I think uh, two factors right now are very important and very positive. One, of course, we had surprisingly strong U.S. growth in the first quarter, so that suggests all the talk that we had at the land of last year about the risk of a recession in the U.S. was, was quite overdone. Uh, so underlying fundamental growth still very solid in America. And we also need to recognize that the earnings results for this quarter are also very good. Good. Uh, at one point, we had expected an earnings recession, if you will. People were forecasting negative year-on-year -year earnings growth. Uh, it's coming in around 5 percent, which is not spectacular, but compared to the negative expectations before, quite good. So the point here is, uh, yes, we have the risk primarily around trade, uh, but the Fed is still very supportive. It's not going to be raising rates. Economic growth is good. Inflation is quiescent. And earnings growth is coming in quite strong. We also closely going to be watching out for more data that you know comes out from China, the year-on-year -year export numbers for the month of April, as well as the import numbers, balance of trade figures. Considering that the last GDP print that we got of 6.4 percent from China uh, was a relatively strong one, if these trade hurdles continue, um, you know, and the conversations keep getting delayed or getting pushed back, and if, if actually the tariffs come about, which they most likely will on Friday, does that number get threatened and? in a way the repercussions for most of the other emerging markets as well. Well, you're, you're right to focus on the outlook for China because that's going to be crucial uh, certainly for that market but also for the rest of EM and, and frankly also for Europe. Uh, to be honest, I think the data out of China, broadly speaking, has been positive. It does suggest the economy bottomed uh, probably around January and the stimulus measures the government put in place uh, at the end of last year and into this year probably are going to be enough. However, if trade tensions re-escalate and you see certainly an increase in tariffs put on Chinese exports, the government is likely uh, to have to do more to offset that drag on the economy. So I think it's very much touch and go. The economy looks good. It looks to be recovering. Uh, but if you do see a deterioration in the relationship with the U.S., they'll have to do more, particularly to support domestic demand. All right. Uh, the other point being is, you know, while we're taking a look um, at it from an emerging market standpoint, uh, your foreign money has been pretty liberal in terms of uh, you know the month of April and the kind of funds that came into the country. I'm talking about India, but emerging market allocation itself has gone up. There has been money that had flowed in back into China. Uh, 
keeping in mind that there is increased amount of volatility that is expected, do you see that getting uh, a slightly a bit of a bigger risk for foreign money and a pull out of that moving back into the U.S. economy? Well, I mean, it's been notable really how poorly emerging market equities have done so far this year, with the clear exception of China, which is really just a reaction to the very poor performance last year. So China's rebounded very strongly, but net-net not necessarily up so much. The rest of emerging markets has lagged. I think at least part of that has to do with the dollar, which has been stronger than we expected against emerging markets. Secondarily, as I mentioned before, earnings growth in America is very good, uh, and the Fed is very supportive. So it's not so clear uh, that investors are going to be moving significantly into emerging markets. Emerging market equities aren't necessarily much cheaper than developed market equities. So at this point, uh, with a very solid U.S. recovery uh, and strong earnings growth, uh, if you look at the risk to the reward for investing, particularly in U.S. equities versus emerging, emerging market equities, uh, we think investors will continue to allocate towards EM. We don't expect them to pull back. But at the same time, we're not expecting a big rush of new funds into emerging market assets. Uh, Daniel, back home in India also, the earnings expectation for FI20 is somewhere about 20, between 20 to 25 percent. Uh, um, the valuations also for Indian markets remain at elevated levels if you were to compare to other markets. So within that emerging market basket, uh, uh, what's the view about India? Also considering there are a lot of factors now in the near term which will weigh on the markets, we will be getting results of general elections on May 23rd. Mm -hmm. Well, I think from a foreign investor point of view, and, and you've seen this after elections in other countries, of course, we had the Indonesian elections recently, Brazil elections uh, a little while ago, uh, is, you know, the balance between investor hopes for reforms and progress, uh, how immediately or how quickly that's reflected in, in equity market valuations, even before you've had any chance to implement the reforms, and then inevitably does there come a bit of disappointment uh, and like, reality starting to set in at some point. So I think from an investor's, foreign investor's point of view, it's that balance. Uh, expectations, of course, quite high after the initial election uh, of Modi. Uh, at this point, uh, if we look at the valuations, probably a little bit more cautious. And we'll want to see really, do we see the reforms that were promised before actually being implemented and that ultimately, frankly, showing up in corporate profits.